Bruce Manny. I'm Mike Golick. I'm Jessica Smetana. Welcome to another edition of Golick and Smetty. I'm Mike Golick Sr. She is Jess Smetana. And Jess, we are getting closer and closer to the Super Bowl, and which means closer and closer, unfortunately, to the end of the NFL and complete football season. Now the college is over. But we had much better games for the divisional round than we did for the wild card, or wild card round, without a doubt. Uh, maybe some surprises still, but some nice matchups coming up. So it is still uh, heavy driven football here. Yeah. And, and one step closer to road to Las Vegas, where we will get to hang out with each other and maybe I'll bring you some cookies. I don't know. Yes. We'll see. But Mike, I'm excited that we are having Charles McDonald done right now from Yahoo Sports. He also is the host of the Exempt List podcast. Uh, Charles is a recurring guest. If you're a, a fan of the pod, you've heard him give his football takes on here before. But he has had the, I guess, misfortune or fortune of having to go to the coldest, third coldest NFL game in history last weekend. And now uh, Baltimore, where it was, I think you said, what, 50 degrees warmer. It was like 12 degrees this weekend, but you're, you've been on like the Lamar Jackson, uh, Pat Mahomes beat for this off season. So I guess what, what was your reaction after watching that huge win over the Texans in Baltimore on Saturday, Charles? Oh, it was great because I don't have to go back to Buffalo or Kansas city next week, which is what I was really hoping for but it, it was cool because I think in the second half you kind of got to see Lamar Jackson just absolutely take over and after the game uh it was funny that John Harbaugh he told us that at halftime uh Lamar basically had a speech where not many words could be repeated to the rest of the team and just kind of lit them up and then Lamar led the charge on the halftime adjustments that they had to make and they came out and they scored uh, three touchdowns and you know put the game away pretty handily. I thought that thought that that second half was was big for for Lamar and yeah, you know, I guess kind of kind of his legacy, which kind of feels crazy to say about like a 27 year old player who's about to notch his second MVP. But uh, he hadn't made it this far in the postseason before. Last time they had the number one seed, they got upset by the Titans in a pretty uh, embarrassing game for the Ravens. So I would say so for them to kind of get this monkey off their back and have. Lamar being the driving force for that was uh, was pretty cool to watch. And when he he's a guy like when he's just kind of in control and one step ahead of everybody else, it just feels like watching the magician out there. So I'm happy that we get to see uh, not only like the Lamar versus Pat Mahomes kind of spectacle, but also just in general like Lamar versus Steve Spagnuolo, the chief defensive coordinator. How do you start to slow that down? And on the flip side, you get another great matchup with Pat Mahomes and Mike McDonald, who's getting a bunch of head quarter uh, head coaching interviews. So I think this was a it was, it was pretty cool to see just from a a spectacle of Lamar being the magician, taking them home. And then we get to see like the culmination of what they've done this season next week. You know, we saw both number one seeds who get that week off. So the, the, there's always that rest versus rust conversation. I was actually calling that, that game, the San Francisco Green Bay game. You look at both number one seeds, San Francisco had a seven, six lead at half and the Baltimore Houston game was 10, 10 at half. So both teams that had the break, came out a little sluggish. Certainly give credit to Green Bay because they made it a game. We'll get to that that game later on in, in the pod. They made it a game, but Baltimore did what then Baltimore was supposed to do. You know, Houston, uh, surprising to be there. So kudos to them. Big arrow up to their program. But Baltimore was by far the better team. Charles, a lot of time now we talk about Lamar, and, and I think it's unfair in this sport of, of attaching Super Bowls with quarterbacks because it's offense, defense, special teams, even though quarterback's the most important position on the field. But that's really where we are with Lamar, right? I mean, it's been there, done that in the regular season. You're going to be a multiple MVP. And now you got to get it done in the playoffs and, and you got you to cap it off with a Super Bowl win to kind of start your legacy of where you want it to go, don't you? Yeah, and, and the thing with Lamar is uh, – He's obviously very capable of winning a Super Bowl in the NFL, which is, uh, I think, what kind of makes the discourse, or I think what kind of adds some fuel to the discourse, because I don't think anyone thinks he can't do this or he can't get this done. Because to me, it, it kind of reminds me of where, uh, and there's a long way to go before you get to this full stature, but like where Peyton Manning was early in his career, where you watched Peyton Manning play, you're like, this is a quarterback that is obviously good enough to lead his team through the playoffs and win a Super Bowl, but it just kind of hasn't happened yet. And I think for Lamar, what makes this year so imperative is I just don't know when you're going to have a better chance than how it's lined up for them right now, right? Because you have obviously your own skill set. Todd Monken's come in and kind of brought the offense closer to what 
Uh, other teams are running around the league. You revamped the wide receiver room. So now you can run a little bit more 11 personnel than you did in the past. Uh, and not only that, but you have probably the best defense in football with maybe the best defensive coordinator in football. And you get a Chiefs team that it, it, like they on paper, it doesn't look like they match up very well with what the Ravens do on defense. And then you go to the flip side of the NFC. You've already beat the Lions 38 to 6 earlier this season. You beat the crap out of the 49ers on Christmas Day. So this, if there was a year for him to get it done, it seems like it's right now. The opportunity is golden. You have a home game to get to Vegas and play in the Super Bowl. I, 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 you know, I don't like to put that pressure on anyone, but we know that this is kind of like the last check mark that Lamar has on, you know, on his career, which is kind of crazy because he's only 27 and he's only been starting for a few years now. So the amount of things that he's accomplished in this amount of time is pretty remarkable, but it, it just doesn't seem like this can be a better chance than right now for him to kind of get that Super Bowl monkey off his back. You said that there was a, a big fiery halftime speech that Lamar Jackson gave, but I'm curious what other offensive adjustments you saw that the Ravens made that made their offense more effective in the second half and how that might foreshadow the way that they will play against this really stout Chiefs defense in the AFC Championship game. I think the biggest thing they did in the second half was they actually picked up blitzes that they didn't pick up in the first half. Uh like there, there were a bunch of like miscues that they had where if you have a quarterback that's not named Lamar Jackson, you might end up with a lot more negative plays than you did because uh, there are free runners coming all through in the first half. And also, if you just look at the totality of the game, D'Amico Ryan, he blitzed the Ravens on like 70% of Lamar Jackson's drop back. So that was where they thought that they had an advantage over the Ravens offense. And for the first half, they did. And, you know, that really plays into what Steve Spagnuolo wants to do as a defensive coordinator. And that's kind of been his thing for going on like 20 years now. Like he's just going to blitz the crap out of you, whether he's got the front four talent, which he does in Kansas City, uh, or he doesn't, like he kind of did towards the end of his time with uh, the Giants way back in the day. So if they can kind of keep that second half performance rolling where they had a little bit better communication between Lamar and the offensive line and the running backs as far as their pass protection is concerned, uh, that can kind of help them get out of uh, – a potential like slow start against Kansas City because you know as we saw last week with Mahomes or I guess you know a couple of days ago he doesn't really need a whole lot to get going and have a great game so you know you can never have you can never like write off Mahomes torching this Ravens defense just because he is Patrick Mahomes so if they can just kind of avoid some of the blitzes and some of the more excited looks that Steve Spagnuolo is going to send or or just kind of stand tall against them like they did in the second half against Houston uh, I think that that's going to be a pretty big boost for their offense. I just sure hope as a former defensive player that we get a defensive battle with Mahomes and Lamar in the game. Everybody will be so ticked off, but I'll love it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. these are the two the, the two best scoring defenses in the NFL with Baltimore being one, Kansas City not far behind at number two. Let's talk about Kansas City for a minute. You were in the Miami game. First, how cold was it <laughs> there? Um. I, I've struggled to, to to describe like how cold it is because it's not really something that I could have ever been prepared for. And I mean, like I said, this is someone I went to high school in Baltimore, like my dad's from Chicago. So like the cold is not necessarily foreign to me, but minus 30 is absolutely foreign to me. Like I, I, I could, so I remember I was supposed to go in and record video of like fans who were potentially shirtless or acting the fool before the game started first of all there was nobody without clothes on before the game because it was too cold and the second that i pulled my hand out of my glove to try to use my phone my hand started like hurting so bad within like 10 15 seconds my hand was almost unusable so uh we had a 10 minute walk from where the car was to the stadium and I was with my friend Marcel Louis Jacques who covers the Dolphins for ESPN and within about five minutes like we were running to the <laughs> <laughs> to, to the gate because it was so cold like I had on a coat I had on layers the only thing that I was really missing was like a ski mask which I absolutely should have brought because yeah. my face was like cracked and dry by the time I got inside but then I get inside it starts to warm up and I see where I'm sitting like on the press box map and they had me right next to the window. And not only that, but right next to like a crack in the oh. window. So I had to wear a coat basically for the entire second half because it started to get too cold. And then on the way back, my I think on the way back, it got down to like minus 33. And my hands were so cold and Marcel's hands were so cold. 
that after a 10 minute walk outside, we had to wait like 20 minutes before we could drive the car because <laughs> both of our hands had gotten numb. It was, it was awful. Like I can't imagine actually paying money to <laughs> sit out there and watch this game. And I thought one of the funny parts was he, the, first of all, the game didn't even fill up until almost the end of the first quarter. And then you get to the halftime break. Everybody goes inside. Some people didn't come back. And then you, ha but you have all these people like, oh my God, it's so much warmer inside. So the game didn't even fill back up until almost like five minutes left in the third quarter. And by then Tua in the Dolphins offense had just dunked it up so bad that people started to go home. But yeah, it was unfathomably cold. Oh man. And Marcel went to a ASU and oh, now he lives in Miami. So wow. I know he was not feeling good after that one. No, no. <laughs> this, but like, I don't know how you could feel good after that. Like, unless you grew up in Antarctica, yeah. like that's the only way that <laughs> well, you could be used to something Well, like that's that. the thing. Even if you're used to cold, because I grew up in Cleveland and you know used to the cold you're you're not used to that cold the coldest game I ever played in was minus 10 when I was at the Eagles playing the Giants in the Meadowlands one time and you just you can't prepare for it. people ask well how do you get ready you don't you don't you can't practice in it you can't prepare for it you just have to go find out which cleats fit you the best and work the best on the whatever turf you're on and go from there and Miami you know they were like a Ferrari trying to drive in a snowstorm uh, when that wasn't going to work. So then Kansas City gets through Buffalo in another classic matchup with these two teams. I have been a bit surprised because all year, Charles, we kept talking about Kansas City. My God, they're A, they're dropping balls. B, who is the guy? Who is it other than Travis Kelsey? Well, it turns out to be Rasheed Rice, you know, a rookie during the year, but you're waiting for someone else to step up. They're not really stepping up. Pacheco runs like an angry person all the time. I love watching him run. So you didn't think it was as good a team, but the defense was better than it's been in a long time. So now match up this Kansas City. You saw him two weeks ago. You saw Baltimore last week. Now they're matching up. How do you see this one going? Uh, I... You know, on paper, I want to say that the Ravens' defense should have a, a pretty big edge just in terms of, like, overall talent. Um, and I think we've even, see, even seen at times that, uh, like, the tackles tackle duo for Kansas City isn't maybe not as stalwart as they've been in the past. But when you have 15 back there, like, it's he's kind of like the equalizer, you know? It's kind of hard to – it's kind of hard to even do the math on who's better because I would – my gut just says Baltimore is – a lot better on defense in terms of overall talent than the Chiefs are on offense, which is kind of – it's kind of interesting to me that the Chiefs have ended up here because this is largely the same group as last year. You know, you sub in Rasheed Rice for Juju Smith-Schuster, and basically it's the same exact guys, but the production has fallen off a cliff. You know, I don't know whether that's Eric Bieniemy leaving and uh, Matt Nagy coming in or, you know, if it's something else. But uh, for some reason, this group hasn't been able to get organized, and I think that – you know, if they hadn't had the performance they would just had on Sunday, I would say, oh, yeah, Baltimore's defense is going to absolutely kick them in the teeth. But they kind of came through in the clutch with this game on Sunday where it, the offense looked like old. They were a Miko Hardman fumble away from scoring 34 points on the Bills defense. Uh, but, you know, I think Baltimore's defense is a good step up, too. And I think what else plays well for Baltimore is, you know, you kind of get into these games in the playoffs where, um, I think when you if you can kind of mix and match what you do a little bit more, even if you have the talent and kind of catch someone off guard by surprise, uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Because when you go back to like the Cleveland game where they got torched by Houston, you know Jim Schwartz, like he's going to run his defense. He's not going to deviate too much from like single high, cover one, cover three, and just let the front four eat your face off. But with Mike McDonald, he's gotten a little bit more versatility to what he's doing. I think that that can kind of play a hand, a play a role in success in the playoffs. So I would give Baltimore's defense the upper hand just based on talent, but Chiefs got 15. You know, I don't think he could be surprised if he comes out and has a big day. And Baltimore has Kyle Hamilton, who is obviously Mike and I's yeah. favorite yes. player. Yeah. Uh, and Robbie and, um, Stanley. But, and Marlon um, Humphrey's coming back. Oh, you're doing the Notre True, Dame while we were doing the Notre Dame thing. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah. We'll catch on. Um, going back to the Bills for a second and the way that they were not able to score at the end of the game, I guess my question is, like, what was a more inexplicable choice by the Bills? Was it the fake punt play that was called? Not the decision to fake it there. The, the call that they played, or was it – the final two Josh Allen passes into the end zone that would have, if they had scored, given Patrick Mahomes like a whole minute and a yeah. half to also score, but be, were incomplete and then gave their kicker the opportunity to have a longer field goal that went, of course, wide right. 
it's okay. It to me, and it ended up being inconsequential because Nicole Harvey fumbled the ball, right? Correct. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. Out of the end. Right. Yeah. It ended up not it ended up being like not not mattering because the Chiefs also made a horrible mistake. <laughs> but like it's fourth and five, you know, it's not like it's fourth and two or fourth and one. We're maybe like Demar, if you can just get outside and get one yard, we're going home and we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep the ball. Uh, I understand like the Chiefs had ten players on the field, so maybe that played into the decision of of doing like oh we have a numbers advantage. But could you could you not just find someone who like carries the ball on a pretty routine basis to? kind of get that done so like that josh one allen, was, maybe <laughs> yeah like josh allen or james cook or i don't know anyone like if you're gonna I've, i'm always of the belief like if you've made the decision to go for it just run a play with the guys who actually play offense and i know you know maybe you, you won't catch anyone off guard but i'd rather have the ball in josh allen's hands than demar hamlin's hands hot take uh when i i got a half five yards and at, like at the end of the game the second and nine throw if Deion Dawkins just doesn't get treated like a blocking sled by Chris Jones, like that throw was there. And, you know, he kind of got his plant leg stepped on. Um, and it was also in a spot where, like, you can't step up because if you step up, it's probably just a strip sack. Or if you move out the other way, then you're going to mess up the rhythm of the whole play. So that one I kind of put on the left tackle more so than Josh or the Bills. And yeah, if you if you score a touchdown, yeah, Mahomes got – what a minute plus to score come back but at least you're up something you weren't before then so uh i think the demar hamlin one was pretty inexcusable that they got bailed out of by yeah that, you know, that's Harvey. that's just a classic either line up an offense and let them know you're going forward or trying to catch him by surprise and for those that don't know fake punt when you go out there you may have it's all about a formation if you get the look the, the fake is on if you don't get the look the fake is off that's kind of how it how it rolls and they got the look supposedly they wanted and unfortunately it didn't execute very well uh cuz yeah i'm i'm with you if you're going to go for it uh you know Josh Allen's probably the way to go let me let me Charles at least from my end end on this one so we've already had more than a few matchups with Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. That's some really great ones. One so great a couple of years ago, they changed an overtime rule in the playoffs because of it. When all is said and done, because Josh is 27, uh, Lamar is 27, and Patrick's 28. By the time all these guys are done, do you think we'll be talking more about the Mahomes-Josh Allen matchups or Mahomes-Lamar Jackson matchups? Uh, I want to say... Mahomes Jackson because like those are the guys who like are going to have the accolades at the end of this you know the four of the last what six MVPs will have been Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson that's pretty outstanding I know that like Josh Allen he's someone that has MVP talent too he was in the discussion this year until uh his numbers kind of fell off towards the back end of the year when they started running the ball more but still like when you watch him play you know that that's someone who's capable of winning the MVP, but I think, I I I think just in, in general, it's just it's cool that you know you can add even like a Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert in that mix, and all of these guys are in the AFC. So like if if you know for the Super Bowl titles and the MVPs and all that stuff on that side of the of the conference, they all have to interact with each other at some point, which I think is going to make it really cool for us moving forward as fans. But just for now, I think it's the Mahomes Jackson show. Those guys have two MVPs. Patrick Mahomes has the postseason success. Lamar's trying to get there. But I think that that needs to be the rivalry that we start focusing on for the immediate future. Yeah, throw Kenny Pickett in there. You've got oh, such a, a great AFC yeah. quarterback, Stu. Yeah. Charles, before before you go, um, I need to ask you about the Falcons head coaching search <laughs> and your thoughts on your favorite NFL team and who they might replace Arthur Smith with. Dude, I, I like I've told this to a, bit, a bunch of people. I'm being 100% sincere here. I don't really care. Just get a <laughs> like get a quarterback. Please yeah. get a quarterback. Cuz look, like I I didn't realize this until Matt Ryan like that started to fall off a little bit in his last season. I didn't realize how spoiled I've been because I my introduction to this team was Michael Vick being the quarterback in like 2001. Um, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. My dad took me to a game. He did a flip over the end zone against the St. Louis Rams. And I had like an out of body experience that made me a Falcons fan forever. <laughs> you know, he has his little ordeal that you want to call in 2006 and 2007. You're down out of, you're down out of your ass for one year. And then Matt Ryan comes 
And then I get 15 years of Matt Ryan. And now I have nothing. Like, I, I, I'm not built for this no quarterback life. So, yeah, <laughs> losing Ryan Nielsen hurts. It's not good. But I can't go, like, 20 years without a quarterback and all of a sudden just not have one. So, Arthur Blank, you got to fix that right now before Kyle Pitts and Drake London start a mutiny and get themselves out of Atlanta because we know they're good. Just make sure that they're taken care of. And make sure that I'm taken care of. Mm, take yeah. care of Charles. Yeah, there you go. They, they definitely got to go a quarterback, no doubt about it. Mel Kuyper has his first draft projection out, has Atlanta taking outside backer from Bama, Dallas Turner. Uh, he certainly has some weapons on the offensive side of the ball, so you'll see, wonder if they will go on the defensive side of the ball. Charles, appreciate it very much. We know no matter where you'll be this weekend, you will not be as cold as you were a couple of weekends no. ago, and that's got to make you very happy. We do appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. It looks like it's going to rain, though, so have fun with it. Yeah, yeah. I'll be inside. There you go. <laughs> it's all that matters. <laughs> all right, Jess, good to talk to Charles. More on the AFC side, since that's the uh, the side that he covered. Um, but we ended with him. Before we get to the NFC games, um, let's let's look at we, – we stopped – ended with Charles on the coaching uh, aspect. We saw that the uh, Tennessee Titans – they hired Brian Callahan, the offensive coordinator from Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, he's a guy who's worked with quarterbacks, broken into the league with Denver as an offensive assistant back in 2010, was there for, I think, five, six years, worked with Peyton Manning. Then he also worked with Matthew Stafford in Detroit, worked with uh, Derek Carr in, uh, in with the Raiders as well. So he's had success with quarterbacks, and then as of late with Joe Burrow, so and then that's kind of how it works sometimes. Rabel was the coach there, defensive guy. You go oppo, you go offensive guy. It's still getting interesting. We finished the the conversation with Charles about Atlanta. Atlanta now has had two interviews with Harbaugh, two interviews with Belichick, and obviously others as well. This one's going to be interesting because there are reports just that Arthur Blank wants Bill Belichick. But others in the organization are like, no, 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 we gotta, we gotta go younger here and and kind of revamp this thing. What, 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 which way would you go, or where do you think this one goes? I don't know. I think the Bill Belichick situation is so interesting because I don't know how much exactly you like what percentage you blame his last few seasons with the Patriots on him as a GM or him as a head coach, right? Like unequivocally, like the worst coaching job of his career and not having Tom Brady and not having a replacement for Tom Brady, um, you know, hurts a lot. You, you want to have a quarterback and that reflects a lot on the head coach when you just don't have that situation figured out and also are partially the reason why. So I don't necessarily like, I wouldn't doubt that he could win a lot of games with a team like Atlanta in a in a division that is frankly like one of the weakest in the NFL. Um, but like Charles said, they don't have a quarterback. So then you have that same issue where are you drafting someone? Are you trading for someone? Like what's the situation going to be there? So I can see both sides of it. I can see why you want to go younger and why, you know, if you see someone like uh, Shane Steichen with the Colts or like one of these coordinators that have been promoted into head coaching roles have some success on teams why you want to follow that mold and go that route but at the same time I'm like it's Bill Belichick and maybe that's just like my the bias that I have when I hear his name I still think of him as, as a great coach he's like 15 wins away from the record for most wins as a head coach in NFL yeah. history the issue as always when it comes to this is like there's philosophical differences between different parties and that's never a good thing it never ends well because then if the situation goes poorly regardless of who they hire you're going to have this major, you know, I told you so faction within the organization, whether it's blank or the rest of the front office. And and that never ends well. So you kind of just have to get on the same page and make a choice because I, I don't know, you know, at this point, what are you waiting for? If you're not going to hire Belichick, uh, you should just tell him you're not going to hire him because maybe he'll take another job and then you're just stringing someone along. I don't know. It just becomes a whole mess, Mike, honestly. Will, and I don't expect anything less from the Falcons. Will this be like a <laughs> a hall of fame player who is getting up there in years having to try and find a team to play with instead of teams wanting to play with him. Because what if Atlanta doesn't pick bill? I mean, what if, what if bill isn't the first choice or what if bill has to look at a couple of teams before he get, this is, he's going to go down as the greatest coach of all time. And then he's 15 wins away from being the winningest coach of all time. And what if he gets passed over by a couple of teams 
you know, and he's looking for yeah, a job. It I mean, happen. it would be odd. shocking. Yeah. But it seems like it is very, and like Seattle is not going to hire Belichick after they just let go of Pete Carroll, right. who, right. you know, they're very similar age, like similar, I guess I, they were not really the same at all in personality type, but they're probably not going to hire another older guy when they have just let go of Pete Carroll after he had a, a couple like pretty good years at the tail end of his career. I mean, this year they didn't make the playoffs, but um, a resurgence with Geno Smith, at least. I, I don't know. The Chargers is interesting, but I know Jim Harbaugh yeah. has taken a couple interviews there. That seems like it could probably happen. Um, the Panthers, I have no idea. Another well, team. I'm going to say, Jess, the Panthers just hired Dan Morgan as their GM. And Dan Morgan is 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 a on the youngest side. So yeah. do you see Dan Morgan being the GM for Bill Belichick? I mean, I don't I don't foresee that one either. I don't know. I mean, it just goes to show I think the last year, the last couple of years in New England have really hurt his reputation a little bit. And I think there's also a assumption or I mean, maybe it's not an assumption, but a reputation that his style of coaching doesn't work anymore right. in the NFL. And and maybe there is something to that. Um, it's it's really hard to say without being, you know, a player or, or like hearing directly from players who have said that. But that is kind of the the word on Belichick now. I still like I, I guess like as long as I am alive, I, I, I just can't ever think of him as a bad NFL coach or someone right. who's like unqualified to be a coach. Like it, the last few years were really bad. Um, but again, like a lot of it is maybe personnel. So I, it's just, it's hard. And also like when Tom went to Tampa Bay, you had free agents that went to Tampa Bay because Tom was there. If Bill goes to say Atlanta or another team, are you going to get free agents that are going to say, I want to go play there because he's won Super Bowls, but Oh, by the way, what have you done for me lately? He hasn't, right. hasn't even gotten to the playoffs. So I wonder how enticing it will be for that free agent. Now money talks as well, but still, are you going to say, yeah, I want to go play for Bill? I know he's the greatest coach of all time, but not as of late. And the Belichick way isn't the most, you know, most endearing to a lot of players in the NFL anymore. Yeah, no, I I do think it's crazy. I I also think if you're getting if you're getting a head coach with a lot of experience and you're not going the coordinator promotion route, like Jim Harbaugh seems like a more appealing option to me if I am, you know, making that decision because obviously he just won a national championship game. He's taken teams to the Super Bowl before as well in the NFL. And he as weird and just like kind of a he's just a weird guy. As weird as he is, like it seems like especially this past year at Michigan, his players really loved playing for him. And it's different when you're in the NFL, of course. Right. But I guess if you're just comparing those two, you know, head coaches, I see why Jim Harbaugh would be a more, you know, easy sell. Let's get into our heart racing moment of the weekend, shall we? And to me, it's going to be the game I was at, uh, Jess. It was that San Francisco Green Bay game, which Green Bay gave San Francisco the number one seed, everything they could handle. And for the most part, Brock Purdy was off in this game. But he did make it a heart racing moment. That last drive that they needed, they were down 21 17. They go 12 plays, 69 yards. And Purdy was six to seven for 47 yards with a couple of big third down throws as well. So while his game was off, he made it, uh, he made it a big time upbeat moment at the end of the game. And as I mentioned, heart racing moment uh, of the weekend for us. Did you know that your heart attack risk can more than double? When your home team plays, learn more at Assess Your Heart Risk Factors at CheckYourHeartRisk.com. Brought to you by Bear Aspirin, the official sponsor of Fans Hearts. And let me tell you, sitting there in that stadium, the fans' hearts there were beating a little <laughs> bit faster going, wait a minute, we're the one seed. They're the seventh seed. They're a young team with a first-year starting quarterback and a lot of young players. We're the one seed, one of the best teams in the league. And here we are, 7-6 lead at halftime. Down 21-17, need that score coming toward the end of the game. What a game that was and a bright future for Green Bay. But San Francisco, I will say the better team did win this one. I think I agree with you. I think the, like you said, that final drive was pretty insane for Brock Purdy. Five minutes long. It was 12 plays, 69 yards. So they really were managing the clock well. He made some huge throws and they were trying to just get it down to, you know, as long as they could uh, and score so that Green Bay couldn't come back. And then, of course, Green Bay, you know, Jordan Love throws the interception there oh, at the end, which yeah. was also, you know, if you're a Green Bay fan, 
also a, a heart racing yeah. moment watching them try to, you know, with 30 seconds on the clock, basically come back and maybe kick a field goal to tie it. But um, Brock Purdy like really struggled. I think partially you can blame the weather. Partially you can blame Debo Samuel going out early yeah. with that shoulder injury. And it sounds like he's 50, 50 for the NFC championship game. But also, I mean, I think like, He's just, he's just maybe was due for a bad game. Like he it's, it's not easy. What he's doing is not easy. Although I think people want to say like, you know, he's making quick throws and easy throws and it's, he's working as part of the system. Like it's still hard to win a playoff game in these conditions. And so they're, you know, one went away now from uh, the Super Bowl and they have to play Detroit who I, I really, I think Detroit is very capable of winning the NFC championship against the 49ers, but I still think the 49ers are a better team. Uh, I think they're right now seven point favorites at home uh, against the lions on Sunday. So I think the way that the NFC championship goes depends on if Brock Purdy can kind of yeah. go back to how we've gotten used to seeing him play, which is like pretty poised playing well under pressure, getting completing passes. I think it will depend on Debo Samuel, of course, whether or not he can play. You know, before I talk about the lines or that title game, real quick bow on both the others. Green Bay, that throw by by uh, Jordan Love, as w- you know, we're talking about the play and my partner Ryan Radke is calling it. You see him rolling right and you're just, okay, throw it. He had matured so much during the season and played so much better, hadn't turned the ball over. Last eight regular season games, Love was 18 touchdowns, one interception, threw two in this game. And unfortunately for him, they were both on him. One behind the receiver, tipped off his hand and was picked. And this last one, unfortunately, and I'm sure Matt LaFleur sat down with him after and said, listen, we got 40 some seconds ago. We have a timeout. We need about 25, 30 yards to try and kick a tying field goal. That wasn't the time for hero ball. That wasn't the time to try and do a desperation throw. But, you know, he's young. He's going to learn because he's one of the main reasons they were as far as they were because of the way he had been playing. But you look at both teams that lost and the where they're at looking to next year, putting a bow on Tampa Bay and Green Bay. The amazing thing here is of the 10 players that were targeted uh, by the Packers, by Jordan Love in that game, nine are on their rookie contracts. They have such a young team. It was the fourth youngest team ever in the playoffs and the youngest team to ever win a playoff game when they beat Dallas. Whereas Tampa Bay kept paying their players and got themselves into cap trouble because they wanted to keep players around Brady until that experiment was over, which paid off in the Super Bowl. So it worked. So now they have basically, I think, 18 free agents. And Mike Evans being one of them, Baker Mayfield being one of them. So different how they're going to both try and come back uh, next year. But for Detroit, I mean, I love what they're doing. Signing Zach Ertz as well. The tight end that was on Arizona this year got released because Brock Wright hurt his forearm. He may not play in this game, the blocking tight end. And uh, Laporta has that bad knee. And so mm-hmm. you, you now we played, you know, last couple of weeks, but we have to wait and see how it's going to be. Uh, and I'm with you on San Francisco. Is Debo going to – he didn't crack his shoulder. The 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 um, x-rays were negative. He didn't crack it. But, you know, is he going to be out there? Because when he was out of the game, that affected their offense as well. There's no doubt about it. I think San Francisco overall is the better team. I think the biggest matchup is going to be what is that Detroit defense going to be able to do against the multiple, mm-hmm. you know, assets the offense has for uh, San Francisco. So, you know, I think Detroit's the story. I think the uh, the casual fan that doesn't have a horse in this race, you got to believe. You, you think they're going to pull for Detroit and Baltimore because they're two teams that haven't been there? I, well, Baltimore won the Super Bowl, what, 11 years ago? Yeah. So, first of all, I, you know, as an AFC North fan, like I obviously hate the Ravens. Uh, I, I do – I do love Kyle Hamilton though. So that yeah. that's a little bit of a conflict for me. I, I guess like I, I'm kind of at the place with Mahomes where like I want him to win because I think that he is awesome and he deserves to be in the conversation. I he already is in the conversation of like greatest quarterbacks, but you know how it is now that Tom Brady's won six Super Bowls. You need to have like a, cu- a couple more pieces of hardware, right, I think, right. to really like be solid in that. And I just, I don't know. I, I love Mahomes. I want him to win every Super Bowl forever because um, I don't really get sick of watching him play. And he's he's just like that good. So I personally am pulling for the Chiefs, I think. The, I think the AFC Championship game is the more interesting game of the weekend. Like we talked about earlier, watching how these defenses are going to be able to potentially impact uh, both of these like incredible quarterbacks is going to be a great 
um, storyline to watch out for. But I, I guess for Detroit, yes. Like Detroit, their fans, I think, are in a little bit of shock right now. They don't know how to deal with the fact that they won and that they're actually in the NFC Championship game. Their first NFC Championship game since, what, 1992, yeah. I think yeah. you said? Yeah. So I mean, most of these fans probably I, – I, none of the players probably remember the last time Detroit was in an NFC Championship game. And also for Dan Campbell, I I mean, he he's frankly someone that like we made fun of a lot in his introductory press yeah. conference and in all of his speeches and in all of these crazy things that he says. His coffee order is insane. He drinks like – 55 shots of you know yeah. espresso every day um it's I, honestly like i'm not even exaggerating that much it's something ridiculous so i, I think it would be incredible for them to win but i, I at the same time like i i really like i don't have a dog in any of these fights so i don't i don't really care too much i think there's a case to make for any of these teams like really um like needing this, like Kyle Shanahan needs this, right? Like he's how close has he gotten right. and not been able to win one of these Super Bowls that he's with, especially with quarterbacks that everyone else is like, you can't do it with, you know, Jimmy G or Brock Purdy or whatever. And last year, like Brock Purdy hurting his arm in the NFC right. championship game against the Eagles too. Like they were so close and they had to put Christian McCaffrey in at quarterback to finish that game. So I don't know. I, I guess, I guess, yeah, I mean, most people are probably going to be Lions fans this weekend. And most people, I think, when it comes to uh, the, the Chiefs and the Ravens are going to say, like, it, it's going to depend what side of the Taylor Swift debate you yeah. come down on, probably, unfortunately. But um, I don't know. It'd be it'd be cool to see her at the Super Bowl with Jason Kelsey and his shirt off in, in Las Vegas. How great was that with Jason? I mean, it was awesome. You know, the yeah, best that part, was my favorite thing from the week. The best part about it was Jason's wife. Uh, Kylie, who was in the, the the suite as well, you saw her look at him and no surprise look at all. Nothing. Just like, oh, yeah, that's just Jason <laughs> doing his thing. And I tell you, I, I there's part of me from what I'm going to be doing the Super Bowl that wants Kansas City to be there because maybe for that game, Taylor may spend a little bit of time on the Ooh, field. And I I'm am, sure she will. I am doing the sideline for that game. <laughs> Uh, when it was in L.A., I got to talk with The Rock for a while after he was down on the sideline. So that I've been getting to see these halftime shows, which has been awesome and Usher this year. So uh, I'm looking forward to what stars may be down on the field in Vegas. Uh, so before we turn our attention to the NBA, and also I appreciate you when you said the last time they were in the uh, NFC Championship game in 91 or 92 that you didn't say you weren't born yet. Thank you. Well, I that. wasn't. I know you weren't. I know, but I it. but I appreciate you saying that or not saying that. So quickly, let's give picks. I'm going to go. I'm actually picking Baltimore in this game. I think they're okay. the better team. Um, and my heart says, and I'm not calling either the game, so I can pick both. My heart would love to see Detroit, but I just think San Francisco just has too much, and I think that's it's going to be a a lot of strain on that uh, Detroit defense. So. While so I'd you're picking one seeds. Yeah. While I'd like right. to see Detroit go, I'm going to go with both one seeds in this. And by the way, what is it? Uh, Kansas City is a three and a half point underdog and Detroit is a seven point underdog, according to DraftKings Sportsbook at this point. I think I'm with you on the 49ers. Uh, I just think that they are slightly better, like overall. Uh, compared to Detroit, I don't doubt that Detroit, like Dan Campbell's going to have them fired up and they're going to play their hearts out. Um, but I, I give a little bit of an edge to the 49ers. They've just been more consistently good throughout the season, uh, especially if all their playmakers are playing. Um, the Ravens, I like, I don't, I'm one of those people that like, I, I think like last year, maybe the year before I just decided I'm never picking against the chiefs. And so far that's proven to be a really good strategy for picking anything. So I'm just not going to pick against Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. I, I just, know. I really like watching him win games. Like he just does cool stuff all the time and they're just fun to watch. Even when the rest of their team isn't as good, he's still, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Like I didn't expect Travis Kelsey to have that game yep. last weekend, by the way. Um, so who knows? Maybe he'll do it again this weekend. Yeah, it, it's tough to get bet against Pat. I I get it. I get it. But uh, I pick, listen. I picked Buffalo last week over them. I was wrong, and I'm picking Baltimore. So <laughs> so we'll see. All right, we're going to turn our attention to the NBA and the best college women's college basketball player run has a collision on the court that has nothing to do with another player. Uh, we'll chat about that next on Golik and Smitty. 
All right, Jess, what a monster uh, early week we had in the NBA, especially on, on Monday night. I mean, holy smokes, what went on with Joel Embiid scoring 70 points, uh, setting the, the uh, 76ers record, uh, ousting Will Chamberlain, who had the top three amounts uh, for that team. <laughs> uh, now it's Embiid who has the most. You had Carl uh, Anthony Towns with 62 for Minnesota in a loss. Uh, to Charlotte, they they gave up an 18 point lead in the fourth quarter. Their coach lost his mind uh, about that one. Uh, Chris Finch not happy with his team, but he gets 62, and even Durant had 43 for the Suns in a win over the Bulls. But what Joel Embiid is doing in the regular season, and again, it's kind of like the quarterback discussion, Jess, in the NFL. It's like, okay, great what you've done. We've seen it before. We've seen Embiid win the MVP. We've seen him be the uh, leading scorer. Now we need him see, to see him win a title. So he just keeps amazing us. But until he gets that ring on their finger in basketball, that means so much to a legacy. Yeah. What's crazy about the 70-point game, too, is that he had 15 rebounds and five assists, which is something that only he and Michael Jordan have ever had, a 65-plus point game with 15-plus rebounds and five assists. And uh, that's just like an incredible game. He also was the fastest to ever get to 70-plus points in a game in only 36 minutes uh, and 38 seconds. So, I mean, at that, if you're reading that, you have to think, like, how did he not get a little bit more? He had a little yeah. bit more time at the end of the – but I'm just kidding. It was actually crazy. I was watching the game last night um, – the Sixers only won by 10 points. Like it was a right. crazy high scoring game against the Spurs, but the entire, you know, stadium or uh, arena erupted after they, the timeout after his 70th point. It was very, very cool to see him make history like that. But like you said, you know, of course, rings culture is, is a, uh, an unfortunate thing that yeah. we all have to discuss in the conversation about any basketball player's legacy. Um, but I think maybe this is helping Philadelphia fans cope a little bit with the, the way the Eagles season ended, right? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. But again, the hope is there because, they have, you know, they'll be battling Boston and Milwaukee, the same thing again, you know, and maybe Miami sneaks in there again. Who knows uh, with what goes on there? But I think one of the, the amazing stat of Embiid, he's played 32 games. He has 1,156 points in 1,096 minutes. And why I gave those numbers, the pace, it's at a pace of more than one point per minute played is something only Wilt Chamberlain has ever done in the history of the league. So that's crazy. And when you're getting your name mentioned with Wilt, I mean, it is absolutely incredible what he's doing. One thing my son and I were talking about. So Carl Anthony Towns with Minnesota gets 62, and they're feeding him right to mm -hmm. get as many because he had what he had 40 something and a half or 50 something at mm -hmm. halftime. 44, I 44 think. 44 and a yeah. half. So they're feeding it to him. He's shooting horribly in the end, two of 10 in the fourth quarter. They actually blow an 18 point lead and lose, <laughs> to which their coach, Chris Finch, called the, the, the performance disgusting, said he was disgusted <laughs> with their selfish play by feeding Cat the ball, trying to get him more points, even though he was missing. And I wonder what your thoughts are, Jess, on that, because me and Mike were like, you know what? There's 82 games. You know when somebody's on a roll and maybe trying to get after something. You, and, oh, by the way, you're the top team in your conference right now you know, yeah. with 30 wins. So why not throw the ball in and see what he can do on there a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, and they ended up losing by three points. Yeah. It was like a close game until the end. I mean, I don't know because it doesn't probably – I don't know. You're right. There are there are a lot of games, but it probably doesn't feel that good to like break records or have that type of night um, and then lose. Like that – there's just like a little bit of like a, a cloud over that, right, for you? Like right. it, I know it's you don't have to win every game in the NBA. It's not like college football where it's the end of the world once you lose one, but – yeah, uh, you have to wonder if it just kind of feels like a. It tastes a little bit more, you know, sour, he, knowing uh, that the, the game might you might have lost the game by missing a couple of shots. Oh, without a doubt. And what's interesting is we talk about the big man evolution in the game of not just being that five and drop the ball into the paint because big men shoot better. But Embiid only shot two threes and made one. Carl Anthony Towns, I believe he self proclaimed himself the greatest shooting big man of all time. He, he hoisted up 15 threes and made 10. So that's pretty impressive that's on, on what he did. Yeah. So, uh, again, uh, they're tops in the West right now. 
Oklahoma City sitting at second, and uh, Philadelphia is third behind Boston and Milwaukee. But with Embiid, he's got every other accolade you can have, so he needs to get that ring. Uh, so we'll see if he gets it. In college hoops, and women's college hoops, I, I'm getting your interested in your thoughts on this. With uh, Caitlin Clark, Iowa played at Ohio State. Ohio State upset them and stormed the court at the end. And as mm-hmm. Caitlin Clark was trying to run off the court, there was a young lady running on with a phone in her hand, which is pretty, you know, prevalent today where people walking down the street with a phone in her hand, not seeing where they're going. And she and Caitlin Clark, Clark collided. Caitlin went down. This girl went down, got up and walked off into the crowd. And Clark got the wind knocked out of her. And there was a whole lot made about this. Gene Smith, the AD for Ohio State, apologized to Iowa and Caitlin Clark for it. But I, I don't want to see anything go on with storming the court, though, Jess. I hope, even though I know in football and the SEC, they find schools if the yeah. team does that. I, I, I kind of like it, man. They're 18 to 22-year-olds having a ball in college, man. I, I just I still don't have a problem with storming the court. I feel like it's this is how I feel about like a lot of things where like make it legal, but like highly regulate the way the opposing team can get off the court. So like you let the fans storm it, but you have to wait until because, OK, first of all, I want to see the video. I want to see the video that the, the, person the was first person video, right, of her holding it. Yes. Clark, Caitlin Clark. That's hard to say fast um, because it has to have been insane. Yes. Okay, and Caitlin Clark, like you can see her running and her head's down and like just bangs into this person and and they both go flying um but like that shouldn't happen like i don't mind i like court storming i like field storming i think it's very much like do as your own risk as a fan type behaviors like you know if you're jumping from the stands at a football game like you might hurt yourself so you know be careful choose your spots wisely but on a basketball court like there's how many players there's like 15 players and a couple coaches let them leave and then do How, your thing. Isn't that hard to do, though? I mean, the whole thing about Figure it, it is, out. The whole Figure thing it about out. it is is when like the clock strikes zero and it's it. spontaneous to say, hold that spontaneity until that team gets off. Because they're who knows? They don't get off all that quick, especially if they shake hands and then go off the court. And then that's tough to do. I, I don't know the answer to this, Jess. I really don't. Uh, because I like it. I like the fans being or the students being able to do that. I don't know how to regulate that when I feel bad this happened. Here's and the glad thing. Here's the thing Mike. If Caitlin Clark, the best player in women's basketball this year, had like gotten a concussion or like broken her arm or like something happened and she missed actual time, like we would never, ever, ever see another court storm right? ever again for the rest of eternity. So uh, very lucky that that didn't happen. But they need to figure out a way to stop that from happening in the future because it it almost happened. I mean, she yeah. like they they hit each other. They collided very hard. Yeah, yeah, Could've that was bad. glad glad everybody was all right in that one. All right, so we got uh, the conference championships coming up this week. Then a week uh, off in between, but uh, at the end of that following week, we will be in Vegas for the Super Bowl. Jess, you and I hanging out. We're looking forward uh, to that. I'm looking forward to to to. Uh, taking a kitchen away from some restaurant to let you bake in it because I know that's, uh, and, and hanging out with you. And uh, are you a gambler? Are, are we looking to gamble together here? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to play some, uh, maybe some blackjack. I oh, okay. All right. Are you a seasoned blackjack player? No, no, I'm not. A, I'm not a seasoned anything, Mike. Okay. I'm just, you know, I dabble. All right, we're going to sit at a table together and play. I'm looking forward to Maybe I'll to play that. the slots like Chris. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. She's kind of inspired me. She is. She, she, she grinds. She grinds. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. She sometimes takes some heavy losses before she gets to some wins. So, uh, it's, uh, it's, okay, maybe I won't yeah. do that. <laughs> Can you teach me how to play craps? Uh, you know what? Maybe we'll learn that together because okay. I want to learn that as well. And they said the best thing to do is to go – during the day, and we're going to have plenty of time there, during the day when it's not crowded and the people working the table will explain it because I would like to learn that a little bit. So let's do that. Okay, I'm down. That's my goal for the week. I don't care about anything else, you know, career related. I just want to learn how to play craps. Oh, that's it. We are going to play craps. (laughs) Craps. 